Welcome back out on the mushroom trail. It's a beautiful August day. It's hot, it's dry out here in the forests of the Pacific Northwest, so not ideal mushroom season to say the least, but you know what? There's always something out here. So let's jump in. Let's see what we see. And check this out from all the way back here. I can make out the unmistakable glow of a Pacific Golden Chanterelle. Another one showing up here. Check this guy out. Just a beautiful mushroom. Let's give it a little bit of a tug. Looks like twins here. Just beautiful, beautiful mushroom. Looks like the cap will need trimmed just a bit, but boy, it's a decent size chanterelle for August. I'm sure it'll be delicious. I'll look around here and just see if we see any more. I see the beginning of one that I'm gonna certainly leave over here. Let's see if I can get the camera on it. Yeah, there's a little bit of one down there. Let's see if we've got any more. Yeah, sure enough, here's another one. So they're still out. Pacific Golden Chanterelles doing their thing. I'm gonna poke around here, see what else I can do to pull up some more August Chanterelles out here. Super pleased to have found them now June, July in August. I think I may see another one back there. I'm gonna go investigate. So moving just up the trail, check this out. Another splash of color. It's amazing that this is here considering that it's literally right off a relatively heavily trafficked trail. Give that guy a little tug. Beautiful. Beautiful Pacific Golden Chanterelle. Such a treat during the summertime. Actually coming up here, I noticed another, what I believe is a chanterelle. Let's actually see if we can kind of get eyes on it. Yeah, let's go take a look. All right, so this looks to be another one. In a little different state though, this is a little bit dried out. Boy, still looks decent. Oh wow, we'll see. Looks like there's more going on down there. Unfortunately, I grabbed this one. This would have been a really good one to cut because we've got this little primordia off to the side here. But we can see that this one probably got excited with a little bit of rain and uh, may have gotten a little bit too dry for it out here, but I'll still take that home, still cook it up. It's got a real nice smell to it. I can smell it from here, that wonderful apricot smell. Such a treat this time of year in August. So we'll take these back, clean them up, and throw them in tonight's meal. Love finding these chanterelles this time of year. And moving just down the trail here, we've got a really interesting mushroom that's just off to the side of the trail, growing from this, you can't really see it, but there's a conifer log that's underneath this mossy layer here. And we can see it's a little bit dried out, but this actually has a somewhat velvety or fuzzy cap we notice that we've got this little dusty layer that's light yellow or light brown. We see some up on the cap too. That's of course indicative of the spore color. So that's kind of a natural sort of spore print. So this is spored out. If I take a look underneath, what you're gonna notice is that this one, let me see if I can really get under there. The base of this is gonna be tomentose, so a little little velvety or furry. And although this has characteristics 
of a poured mushroom. When I pull this up and turn it over, take a look. So earlier, you know, say like a week or two ago, this would have been a very light colored gill. So in fact, I saw this or encountered it in the forest not too long ago, and it had a yellow gill structure underneath there. It's now turned to a darker color and it's sort of getting a little inky. We can see how too the cap is kind of curled in a bit. This is what's commonly referred to as the velvet footed tap. So some of you may have heard of or uh, be familiar with the velvet footed packs. And oddly enough, even though this is a gilled mushroom, it's actually related to the boletes. And that's because of its spore shape. So it's got that kind of oblong spore shape that's typical of the boletes. So super interesting to see. Now this is one of the dyer's mushrooms. So this is sometimes used to bring out quite a range of colors. It's really sensitive to both temperature and pH. So you can get everything from like browns to darker shades and even purples and different things. So very interesting. Now this is not regarded as an edible mushroom. In fact, it's widely regarded as inedible, but it's worth noting that in East Europe, this has been eaten and there are different preparation methods, some of them fairly complex involving multiple kind of boils of water and different things. But again, here, I don't know of anyone who's ever consumed this that I know personally. And um, I've read that it can be quite bitter tasting and that there's different ways that you can kind of deal with it. But um, I've also heard that sometimes people will eat them when they find them young, but at this stage, they probably would not. Again, on here, you can see this fibrous layer. So again, this is the velvet footed tap. That tap is short for tapanella. So this, this Latin name is tapanella atrotomentosa. So interesting to see, a really fun one to come across. It's fairly, uh, fairly common, but I don't see it that frequently, if that makes sense. So I know it's out here, but it doesn't really stand out. Again, typically you're gonna see this growing off of conifer wood late summer, early fall, but it doesn't always stand out or catch people's eyes. And uh, you know, as referenced, or as I'm sure a lot of you are finding right now, this isn't prime time for mushrooms out here in the Pacific Northwest. So it's not something that uh, people are really on the lookout for, and there aren't a ton of mushrooms out right now. So it makes sense that this one is not one that a lot of people are necessarily referencing or frequently bumping into. So it's a little bit, rarer than other mushrooms, but it just might be that it's not being noticed or discovered. So cool to see, again, that's the velvet footed tap. So if you're here in the Pacific Northwest, you're no stranger to blackberries this time of year. So you can see right here, we've got a lot of blackberries just starting to hit. And if you look at this leaf pattern right here, so this is probably our most common and invasive blackberry. This is what's typically referred to as the Himalayan blackberry. It's an introduced species that can be kind of a little bit of a disaster. It can take over an area, produces a decent tasting berry. A lot of times when people reference the idea of going out to forage blackberries, this is what typically a lot of people here in the Pacific Northwest think of. But here's what's interesting. If we look a little further down the trail, we've got yet another type of blackberry. This one is what's referred to as the evergreen blackberry. So this is also an introduced species. I would say in list uh, or kind of in rank of my preferred blackberries, I would say I would put this one slightly above the Himalayan blackberry. In my mind, it's a little, little sweeter, a little less sour little tastier so it's good if you can find this one in my opinion it's got kind of a more classic blackberry taste but it's still not my favorite if we move a little further up the trail we've actually got a native blackberry i see some of the leaves of it right here this is actually my all-time favorite blackberry a lot of times people are surprised to realize that we've got really several different species right and this trailing blackberry is our native species. Let's go a little further up the trail. We'll see if we can find some fruiting 
This tends to hit a little earlier in the season, so I've been eating quite a few of those over the course of the last several weeks, but we can still find some. So let's poke around and I'll get those on camera. This is easily, hands down, my favorite blackberry out here. So if you're into berries out here in the Pacific Northwest and you haven't explored or really distinguished between the invasive or introduced blackberries and our native trailing blackberry, I'd encourage you to do so and just to have a little taste test for yourself, see which one you prefer. So here we go, here's what we're really after. So see this little kind of thorny, viney growth, a lot more slender, smaller leaf structure here on this particular native blackberry. If we take a look right back here, we can see, so this is a much smaller berry and this is absolutely delicious. We can see a couple back here so we can see the red one is not quite ripe, so it's still in the way. This one right here is perfect. This is one of the more delicious berries that you'll find out here in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. And again, you can see how different this is from either the Himalayan blackberry or the evergreen blackberry, which is also called or referred to as the cutleaf blackberry. So take a look at this. We've got a western hemlock snag. So again, standing dead wood, pretty good sized tree. And off to the side over here, I see a little nub, a little white color jutting off the side. At first glance, some people may mistake this for the red belted conch, Fomatopsis munciae, but this is in fact not the red belted conch. This is my favorite medicinal mushroom, the west coast reishi. Ganoderma organensi. Look at that color, just beautiful. If any of you are watching this video right now and you missed the video I put out last week, I went into depth and detail on this one and this is just such a treasure out here in the forest. It almost doesn't even look real. Look at this white outer margin. It's soft to the touch. You can see even just the slightest tap of my finger leaving a mark on the edge of that highly medicinal mushroom, adaptogenic, just contains all kinds of beta-glucans and really do a lot with this one. So I'd encourage you, check out that video if you haven't seen it. And keep your eyes peeled on these large western hemlock snags. Notice up over here, I'm seeing a very similar thing going on. So you can see this is in its very early stages. So this is gonna grow out, probably become a massive conch. These of course are annual. So unlike the red belted conch, which is a perennial, that kind of begins, once it begins its growth, it continues to do its thing throughout the year and just kind of adds on to a single fruiting body. This is actually seasonal. So it's gonna come out right around this time of year late July, August, kind of peaking in September, and then it'll fade away. And uh, wait, you'll have to wait until next year to find these again. But my favorite one that I consume on a regular basis, West Coast Reishi, always a pleasure. And I'm not sure you're gonna be able to make out these Cooper's Hawks that are out here. We've got three young Cooper's Hawks that are quite rowdy out here, kind of wreaking havoc out here in this part of the forest. You can hear them kind of yelling at each other. You can also hear all the alarms of the other birds that are kind of confused and don't know what to make of all the chaos, but it's been ensuing for weeks upon weeks now. I've really enjoyed watching them just to kind of see what they get into out here. Really fun to watch. So for those of you who did see the video that I put out a couple weeks back specifically on the West Coast Reishi, I figured this would be an interesting spot to revisit. So a few weeks ago when I was filming that, I used this as an example of, again, the red belted conch. Fomatopsis munciae, which was growing 
on the same tree, the same western hemlock, as a developing little bud of the West Coast reishi, which was actually here. It looks like someone came through and harvested that off of there. I was keeping an eye on it and it was getting to be quite colorful. It was a pretty uh, attractive little mushroom that I can see why it would catch the eye of a passerby. If we zoom in here though, we can see a new one starting to fruit out right there, as well as up here. So that's cool to see. Something else is catching my eye right down here on the trail. Check this out. This is cool. These little nubs, also the West Coast reishi, Anoderma organensi. So we see that right down there coming off of this little chunk of root from that same Western hemlock. So kind of neat to think that if you find one productive snag or downed tree, you're likely to find a lot of activity going on. We can see this one, super small, but coming off of the base. I suspect too, that as we look around this, oh yeah, there's one other one down there, hiding behind this fern here. So just beautiful to see them in this early state here. Again, you know, if we look over here, we can see a previous year's little fruit body that is kind of dried up and hardened some but they're really coming out right now. So if you're out here in the forest, keep your eyes peeled. And I'm just off here, a little bit off trail right now. Just kind of seeing what I see out here. Not a lot going on. It's hot and everything's just kind of hanging out and resting. I did come across this, kind of interesting to see. We've certainly come across plenty of these in the past. Several of you will recognize this is an Amanita mushroom. So we can see that we've got those warts on the cap, those little white speckles, those being the remnants of the universal veil. We also see the remnant of a partial veil down here. So we can see that this is quite dried out. It's a little bit wet to the touch and it's actually breaking off at the base. If this had been a little cleaner, we would have noticed a full bulb or vulva at the base, which is not the case here. But we do see those white gills and we see the partial veil, the remnants of the universal veil up top, that kind of golden yellow color. I believe that what we're looking at is a member of what we kind of loosely describe as the gemmed Amanita group. So again, this is not a particularly adequately described species out here. Um, I've heard it go by several different names and Gem Damanita is actually based on European taxonomy so this is certainly not that exact species but cool to see though. So take a look at this. These are just kind of jumping out at me. So all along this trail I'm seeing a lot of these kind of fresh squirrel chewings of the young Douglas fir cones. So they're certainly going to town on those, that's for sure. But there's something else that's been jumping out at me that's just up here that can kind of look similar, but is a little bit different. Take a look at this guy right down here. So you'll notice, you'll start to see these showing up on the forest floor more and more often. And you can see that it's got these hairy kind of almost spiky little hairs coming off of this. This is housing a beaked hazelnut. And if we were to peel this back, we'll see if I can do this one handed here, but basically inside of here is a young hazelnut. And my suspicion is, is that this has been kind of liberated from the tree a little bit early. And it seems like the squirrels are already getting in to these hazelnuts. So you can see that hazelnut underneath. You'll see the beaked hazelnut are native species that grows in the understory here in the Pacific Northwest. You'll oftentimes see it growing like this. So you'll see a lot of like these really straight 
trunks or stems from this shrubby little growth that'll kind of work its way up into the lower canopy here. And that's, of course, where those hazelnuts are coming from. I'm just, I wanted to pause to point that out because I'm always interested in seeing kind of what's going on specifically with the trees. Because as you all know, the trees are an essential part of reading the forest and kind of understanding the mushrooms better. So if you pay attention to where these hazelnuts are doing their thing, a lot of times those will be the same exact spots that a few months from now, I'll be kind of looking carefully and closely for candy cap mushrooms. Those tend to show up the same places these hazelnuts do. So just figured I'd point that out. Keep your eyes peeled if you're walking the trails out here in the Pacific Northwest. Keep your eyes peeled for the first signs of those hazelnuts dropping or being forcefully dropped to the earth by these eager squirrels because something that I'm seeing more and more and just a cool thing to pick up on. Let me know too if you've ever foraged these. These can be a great fall edible. I don't think of them as being in season right now. I feel like we're still a little bit early, but we're certainly getting there. You can see that hazelnut hiding underneath. So maybe we're closer than I think. So check this out, this is kind of cool. I'm up on this log. A lot of times I'll walk along down trees to access kind of deeper parts of the forest that are maybe tougher to access. We can see on this particular down dug fir, we've got all of these young Fomatopsis munciae, the red belted conch. Again, very common mushroom that we oftentimes see growing off of Douglas fir and just our conifers in general out here probably the most common mushroom out here in the forest. But take a look at this one. This is quite a bit different. So notice this has a very vibrant orange color to it. And if I kind of give that a little bit of a feel, it's a little bit soft to the touch. It's kind of fuzzy or felty up top. I'm gonna to break this one off so that we can take a look at the underside notice you can kind of get a sense of that velvety texture underneath there and on the side you can see already that this is going to be a poured mushroom if i flip this over you'll notice how it's got sort of these elongated pores so this is one that we featured in a video past it's not one that's necessarily well represented in a lot of the field guides this is one that's known as pycnoporellus fulgens just a beautiful, beautiful mushroom. We can see that it's got a resident here who's burying in. So apparently some of the creatures find this one a comforting place to hang out. But super interesting mushroom with a really unique texture and a unique pore structure. It's just a really beautiful mushroom that stands out here in the forest. So keep your eyes peeled amongst the red belted conchs and other kind of more common shelf mushroom growth that you're seeing. You might see woven in there, sharing that space. You may see some of these guys. So really a beautiful mushroom, one that I always love to stop to admire. I don't see it quite as often as some of these other shelf mushrooms, but anytime I do, I always love to stop to check it out, see what's going on and to say hi. So just down here off the trail, we've got a very common plant out here in the Pacific Northwest. This is a common feature of the understory here throughout the Pacific Northwest. This is what's commonly referred to as Oregon grape. Now there are a couple different species, but this one is the Cascade Oregon grape. So it's a relatively low plant. There's, there's another version of the Oregon grape that's more ornamental that'll oftentimes grow up to a considerable height. But this one, relatively close to the forest floor, this is Berberis nervosa. And you'll notice that right now at this point in time and its cycle, it's starting to fruit out with these nice little berries. These are what some people might refer to as the Oregon grape, but it's actually a berry that grows in these clusters 
And you can see that it's just ripening up right now. Now these are actually edible, but they're super tart. So not recommended outside of making jellies and jams and things like that that involve really sweetening this up. But you can see the leaf pattern. We've got all these little leaflets, right? Lancelot shape and very prickly to the touch. Again, those of you who live here, you're no stranger to this plant. It's incredibly common, one of the most common forest understory plants. But the reason why this really stands out to me and what I've typically used it for is to access a really powerful alkaloid that resides here in the roots of this one. So, and I'm not even gonna dig this up. A lot of times you'll see this in mass. And uh, if you scrape away at the inner bark, you'll notice oftentimes that it has a really bright coloration. Let's see if I can get at that a little bit and show that. So yeah, you can start to see a little bit of that. Yeah, you can really see it now, that bright yellow color. So that yellow color is actually attributed to the alkaloid that I just referenced, one that's referred to as berberine. So this is, as mentioned earlier, it's in the berberis genus. Um, sometimes it gets placed in Mahonia. That's just a different genus name for the same plant. So you'll see it in either one. But that yellow color is indicative of berberine, which is a really powerful plant chemical, an alkaloid that's also found in things like golden seal. And this has a lot of incredible medicinal capabilities. So, you know, it's known as being anti-inflammatory. It's also works in conjunction with a lot of antibiotics. It's antimicrobial. It's really good for heart, liver, um, all kinds of different ailments. And it's been used or looked at in treatment of you know, regulating blood pressure and blood sugar and all kinds of different things. But one of the most fascinating things that I've seen recently, there's been a bit of a craze for berberine and in conjunction specifically with different weight loss therapies. So I've heard this uh, coined as nature's ozempic. So it kind of got really hot here about a year ago as a weight loss medication, um, berberine supplements. So I thought that that's kind of interesting. I don't know, I imagine that like most weight loss trends, that's probably gonna peter out at some point. Maybe perhaps it already has, but this is a really fascinating plant. Some of you may be familiar with uh, golden seal, which has been really over harvested and overused here in the US. And I know that oftentimes this particular plant, Oregon grape, is used as a substitute to golden seal. So kind of interesting. And one of those ones, we'll talk about this in greater detail as time goes on, but it's a really good one to know. And especially right now with these real distinctive uh, berries that it's bearing, um, it's really easy to kind of pick up on this if it's not one that you're familiar with. I'd suggest getting acquainted with it. Really a beautiful plant that is one of my favorites out here, the forests of Western Washington. And just real quick, some of you may remember me referencing this plant in the springtime. So this had actually bright yellow flowers that are actually edible, that are really kind of tart, a delicious edible flower in the springtime. Of course, those flowers have given way to these berries now. So interesting to track that through the season. And just real quick too, so if I were to use this or when I have used this, the way in which I've put it to use is primarily through a tincture. So I'll oftentimes find a huge patch of this. So I'm always particular about any time that I'm harvesting this, I don't wanna harvest it from a spot where I'm just seeing a single plant or two, but an entire grove. And so what I'll do is uh, harvest a few plants and then shave it down with a knife to access this inner bark layer that's yellow. That again contains those, those alkaloids or those active constituents that we want to access. And so I would typically do that through a tincture uh, using alcohol to extract those. So um, we can talk about that more in the future. Typically I would do that in the fall time when the energy is moving down into the root system. That's really the ideal time to kind of work with that inner bark layer. Um, so cool to point out though, and just one of those plants that's just adds so much to the character of the forest out here. So if you're not familiar with it, 
get associated with this one. Keep an eye out for it. Get to know it because it's a good friend out here and one that is certainly a common sight, common to come across out here in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. And I'm just up on another downed hemlock and look what we've got going on here. So moving down this hemlock snag, under the sword ferns, we've got hiding out yet another West Coast reishi, Ganoderma organensi. One of my absolute favorite mushrooms, if not my absolute favorite. And further on down this log, we've got the red belted conch. So again, you know, as I referenced in that more in-depth reishi video a couple weeks ago, these guys are brown rot decayers. So they're working away at the cellulose, whereas the reishi, which is sharing the same log with it, is what we refer to as a white rot decayer. So these guys are both going to work on the same exact log here, but they're fulfilling different roles in that decay or breakdown process, which I find to be very interesting. So both seem to be content doing their thing together here on this Western Hemlock. And holy smokes, take a look at this. So just off to the side of the trail here, look at this beauty. This is just a massive, massive mushroom. So notice it's got a little bit of a furry cap. And again, this has a wavy margin feels very firm to the touch. Now this is a good sized mushroom as you can see. As I look underneath, notice what we've got here. So we've got that dark velvety stipe and then we've got these light gills. So this is another prime example of that velvet footed tap. And look at this, it's just beautiful. I'm gonna actually give this a tug because I wanna take a good close look at this underside. Now notice that on this one, it's a little different than that other one because it's just so much bigger. But we can see it's also younger, right? So see how those gills are light gills. Again, and this has a prime example of that dark velvety stipe. But again, this thing just massive growing from the base of this Douglas fir here, coming out of the moss. So again, you're gonna see this growing on from conifer wood. I'm kind of curious. Yeah, sure enough. So I had to look up to confirm that this was in fact a snag and not a living tree. But again, just seeing this velvet footed tap here tells me that it's growing from dead conifer wood. So I would have only been surprised if I looked up and saw that this was a living tree, in which case I would suspect that there's some piece of dead wood down here that I wasn't able to detect. But it makes sense that it's a snag. And uh, boy, just what a beautiful, beautiful mushroom. Just huge. So, and again, this is younger. So as this thing ages, it's gonna darken in color and uh, as you saw in that last one, that cap will get quite dark. When this is young, the margin will curl inwards. And as it gets older like this, it'll start to kind of open up and uh, get this kind of unique lobed, kind of unfurled look to it. So very cool to see. What a beautiful, beautiful mushroom. These guys are really out right now. I wish they were edible because that would be quite the meal right there. And again, I guess according to some, especially if I were in Eastern Europe, I might add this to the basket, bring it home to the table, but unfortunately, it's not on my list. So take a look just on the trail up here. We've got a really beautiful plant that also has plenty of medicinal capabilities. This is common self heal, Prunella vulgaris. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Notice that if we look at kind of the base of this, it's got square stems, opposite leaves, classic kind of mint looking plant. But again, a lot of medicinal capabilities. I don't want to go into great detail on it, but 
Just figured I'd pause to point it out. I'm sure some of you recognize this one. Beautiful to look at. And look at this beautiful little red belted conch from the top, says Montier. Boy, look at the way that that sunlight is just hitting those beads of cetacean. Again, these are the metabolites. They're being shed by this mushroom. This happens especially during growth phases or extreme temperature changes. And again, as referenced in previous videos, it's believed that there's a lot of interesting chemistry, bioactive compounds contained within the gutation of different saprophytic mushrooms, little shelf mushrooms and conchs, just like this guy right here, our old friend. Fomatopsis muncie. What a beauty, right? 